You found a podcast where you'll hear the truth, and we will praise Jesus' name. We stand for the Bible and won't back down from it, although it don't bring much fame. Some folks will like it, some will try to deny it, but God's word will always stand true. It's been tried in the fire, still. Hello, friends and faithful listeners. It's time for the Pod King Bible Study. I'm your co-host, Donald King, and I'm joined by the host of this study, Brother Donnie King. On this podcast, we study the Bible from its original languages so we can understand the Word of God more clearly. We look at current events and news in light of Scripture, and we also examine some of the things going on within our culture from a biblical perspective. This is Monday, October the 28th, episode number 333, The Hope of the Gospel, Colossians 1. 23 through 25. Last time we talked about some more amazing things that Paul told the Colossian believers. He proclaimed that Jesus made peace through the blood of his cross and reconciled all things to himself. We were alienated from God and were his enemies. But despite that, we have now been reconciled to God through the death of Christ. Because of this, we are now unblameable and unrebukable in his sight. We talked about all of this and much more. We feel you'll miss out on a lot unless you listen to this episode, so go ahead and listen to it. Today, we talk about our need to continue in the faith, being grounded and settled. We are to never move away from the gospel of which Paul was called to minister. We talk about how Paul viewed his ministry and how he suffered so much for the gospel. He believed he was called to fulfill the will of God by preaching the word of God. This encouraging episode will benefit every believer and challenge every unbeliever. We invite you to listen to it today. Now for the teaching of God's Word and the lesson for today, we'll turn it to the host of our podcast, Brother Donnie King. Well, this is the Pod King Bible Study, and we want to give you the warmest of welcomes that could be extended. You've arrived just in time. Our study will begin in just a few minutes. Well, don't let the ship sail on without us. My goodness, you sound like you're in a hurry today. Well, I'm not in a major hurry, but I can't hardly wait to get this episode up and running. Well, we don't need to run past our thankfulness for our listeners, though. You know, they are the ones who make this podcast what it is. Well, I agree with you. But when you have some hope, you want to give it to somebody and you don't want to drag it out and prolong it. No. Well, I'm with you on that, but you don't just walk into church and take the pulpit and start preaching, you know, without at least welcoming everyone and giving a few preliminaries. Okay, you win. What is it you want me to say then? That's a good question. (laughs) But if you have some hope to give out to people, you can start by doing that. I'm about to blow a head gasket over here. That was my idea, and you were shaming me for being in such a hurry, and now you're telling me to get started? Hey, don't make me out to be the bad guy. I sure ain't going to withhold hope from anyone. Well, I think you like pulling my leg more than anything and then acting like you haven't done anything about it. Okay. You say you have some hope to offer the people today, so what kind of hope? Well, it's the greatest form of hope known to man. It's the hope of the gospel. Okay. Well, Jesus came from heaven to earth to give man hope. And through his death, burial, and resurrection, we have the gospel message. And because we have the gospel message, we can all have hope. Amen. Now that you've already taught the lesson, go ahead and ask me the question of the day. (laughs) I haven't taught the lesson. I just gave a description of the hope that the gospel gives us. Why don't you get us going now that we're already in the middle of it all? Yeah, why didn't I think of that? (laughs) All right, let's go to Colossians 1 and verse 23, and this will get us started. And boy, this is good right from the get-go. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now, all of the things that we looked at in verses 21 and 22 last Monday are powerful and they're glorious, but they're also conditional, according to Paul. Here in verse 23, he says that all of those things from verse 21 and verse 22 are true if we continue in the faith. Well, you know, I feel that's a very legitimate way to process this, for it is entirely logical. And if you don't continue in the faith, you'll not remain holy. And if you refuse to stay in the faith, then you'll not be blameless. If we turn from the faith, we will once again be in need of reproof. That's exactly right. And here's something else I feel like pointing out right here. This verse is definite proof that Paul believed that a person could leave the faith. 
I say this because he warned the Colossian church against it. Now, I agree with what you said about people being able to lead the faith, but where did Paul say anything about that in that verse? Well, I'm looking at this through reverse psychology, for he didn't come right out and say it. Since we're told to continue in the faith, this tells us that there's a real possibility that you don't have to continue in the faith, that you could quit continuing in the faith. Oh, okay. Yeah, I I follow you now. That, That certainly makes sense. I do want to point out the fact that there is nothing iffy about God or salvation. All of the iffiness comes from our end of the spectrum. Notice that Paul said, if ye continue, he didn't say anything about if he continues speaking of God. So it's all on us. Amen. You know, that really resonates with me for we know that God is doing his part. It's us that we must worry about. Yes, it is. I also want to point out that this is not just a random statement. This isn't a slip of the tongue by Paul. Why do you say that? Well, some people would argue that this is only a misunderstood phrase that Paul uttered, and it doesn't mean what it sounds like it's saying. Well, you know, I know the Calvinists don't agree with what you said, but I believe it is scriptural. Well, it is, and you may not believe this, but I have a small list of verses that proves my point. (laughs) I want to look at John 8 and 31 first. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. It doesn't really matter what you profess. If you don't stick with it, that's proof you didn't get what you thought you had. That's right. And the fact is, to be his disciple, you've got to continue in his word. John 15 and 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. I think this is one of the plainest verses that tells us that you can quit following the Lord. If you quit abiding in the vine, you're no longer connected to Jesus. That's exactly right. And Jesus told us, and I believe it's kind of a warning. He tells us to abide in him. And if we don't, then we're heading towards the fire. So that lets you know that if you don't continue following the Lord, you're headed towards the fire. Acts 14 and 22 says they were confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Once again, we see someone exhorting others to keep going and to continue in the faith. These disciples were encouraged to continue in the faith, and they were told that there would be tribulation ahead of them as well. That's right. So they were letting them know it may not be easy, but it's always right to continue following God. The point is that you must continue, never stop following. Let's go to Romans 2 and verse 7. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Paul told the church at Rome to be patient and continue doing well in order to receive eternal life. The obvious idea is that if they don't continue, they won't receive eternal life either. That's the whole point that he's getting at. You got to continue. You got to continue. You got to continually keep serving God. You don't just claim to be a Christian and then you're good for all of eternity and you're headed to heaven. You've got to continue on that pathway. You've got to start. But the most important thing is, is that you continue so you can finish. One of the plainest verses concerning this topic might just be found in Hebrews 3 and 6. And I want to use this right here quickly. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we? If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Notice those phrases. We got to hold fast the confidence. We got to keep doing that right now unto the end. The author of Hebrews said that we're part of the house that God is building. If we continue in the faith by holding fast our confidence. Well, you know, I sure don't see how I could get much plainer than that. No, that's right. Now let's compile what we've been told here in these portions of scripture we've looked at. If we fail to continue in God's word, we're not his disciples. If we fail to abide in him, we're headed towards the fire. We'll face some troubles and some tribulations in life, but we must continue in the faith or we'll face even worse things. If we lose our patience and quit doing well, we'll not receive eternal life. If we lose our confidence and fail to continue in the faith, we are no longer part of the house that God is building. My goodness, there's no way around what these scriptures are saying. All these verses tell us that we must continue in the faith to make it to heaven and to miss hell. That's my point. That's why I wanted to show all of these other verses. Paul is not misspeaking here in Colossians 1 and 23. He was stating what all of the biblical authors have said. 
So the overwhelming majority of the New Testament agrees with what we see Paul saying right here. This means that Colossians 1 and 23 is also telling us we've got to continue in the faith to be holy, to be blameless, and to be unreprovable. But there are some people who believe this doesn't apply to us as it did to the Colossian church. They say that Paul wrote to a church that was at the crossroads concerning the faith, and they were just being infiltrated with false teachers and therefore, I guess, false doctrines. They were leaving their trust in Christ and turning to a new man-made doctrine. They believed that they keep enough rules, follow enough traditions, and still believe the gospel of Christ. Yeah, and historically, all of that is true to a degree. For Paul was warning them not to go in another direction, and the other direction would have been what the false teachers were offering. This is why he told them to continue with what Jesus said, what the gospel message that they had believed said, and all of this is true, but guess what? I believe that this is still relevant for us today as well, not just for back then. I believe that applies to us right now. Well, can you give your reason for believing this applies to us as well? Well, these things are a real possibility still yet today. I mean, for many people are still believing false doctrines. There is a real possibility of a deceiver coming into our churches and leading away people right now. Many people are settling for new rules. No matter whether it's more liberal or more conservative, they're taking that over the gospel. Some people are more happy with traditions that take them away from God than they are with the actual word of God. We all need to continue in the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ above all other things, not just the Colossian believers. That includes us, too. Okay, I'm with you, but I just wanted to see how you would defend your position. Paul said that we must continue in the faith by being grounded and settled in the faith. Yes, and this is very similar to what is written in a couple of other places, specifically 1 Peter 5 and 10 is what I want to look at. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. So between what Paul and Peter are saying, we're being perfected, we're being established, we're being strengthened, we're being settled, and we're being grounded in our faith in Christ. Well, now, do all of those statements mean the exact same thing? No, but I do believe that they're all very closely related. Okay, well, most of all, I guess we need to continue in the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we do this by being established and strengthened. That's right. And to me, this reminds me of something else that Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 and 58. We're to be steadfast and unmovable. All of that goes along with what we're looking at, too. And let me add this to it. Ephesians 3 and 17, he talks about being rooted and grounded in love. So this is something very common about being grounded, being rooted, being settled, being established. Over and over, you see these phrases. Hey, now, I like that. You know, we must be rooted, grounded, and settled in the faith. Amen. So allow me to break some of this down for us so we can understand it a little better. The word rooted means to have a strong root system that goes down deep. To be grounded means to be established. It literally interprets as to have a foundation. You'll never make it unless you have a firm foundation of faith. I agree with that. And settled means to be firm and steadfast. It speaks of being unmovable in your belief system. We need a lot of people like that. Yes, you know, this was definitely the way Paul meant to use this word, for he goes on to say that we need these things so we will not be moved away from the hope of the gospel. Amen. And think about this. If you have strong roots, you can't be easily moved. Think about a tree that's got real deep roots. You don't just push that tree over. You don't just go over there and bump into it and it falls. When it's got strong roots, it's not going to be easily moved. If you're grounded with a strong foundation of faith, you won't be easily moved. Because think about the foundation. How many times have you ever seen anybody come in and lay a foundation, you just went over and just began to push it and it just caved in? It doesn't happen. When the foundation is laid right, it's not easily moved. How many foundations have you ever seen get moved from place to place? Well, you don't. Um, Boy, that really gives us a mental picture that speaks volumes to us. That's right. Think about it. You don't put in a foundation and say, oops, uh, I wanted it on the other side of the property, and you just pick it up and move it. Foundations, when they're put in, they're there to stay. They're not just there for a time. They are put there to remain. And that's what God's telling us. He has settled us. He has put us as a foundation down. And he says, if you can get your foundation in the gospel, you won't be moved. 
If you're settled and steadfast in what you believe, you'll not be easily moved from the hope that you receive from the gospel. I find it really interesting in Paul's choice of words for moved. Oh, yeah? What's the big deal with that? Well, he used a Greek word, metakaneo. Metakaneo is a really, really interesting word to look into. It literally interprets as to be shifted away from. Now, that might not mean a lot to anyone, but think about it. What would shift you? What would shift you away from something? Mm -hmm. This is a term used to describe a foundation that has been shifted by an earthquake or a very strong tremor. Paul is letting us know that we might have some things that shakes us and maybe some things that even rocks us to our core, but we don't have to be shifted from where we're settled. That's right. But the good news is that we can be rooted, settled, and grounded until we won't be moved. Amen. I love the phrase Paul used here, the hope of the gospel, because it's so descriptive and true. The gospel gives hope to the hopeless. Yes, it does. This is a reference back to Colossians 1 and 5, if you think about it, when he was first starting this letter off. He said, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. See, he connects the hope with the gospel again. And I believe that verse 23 is not just looking back to verse 5. But it's looking forward to verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Once again, verse 5, verse 23, verse 27, he's talking about hope. This is a letter of hope right here. It still amazes me how Paul ties everything within his epistles together. He does. All you get to do is look at the overview of what he's saying and look at the common words and the themes and over and over and over, Paul's tying it all together. He'll say a little something, he'll build on it, he'll say it again more deeply, build upon it, and just over and over he keeps on adding to it. In verse 5, our hope is said to be laid up for us in heaven, and that hope came to us through the truth of the gospel. If you have hope today, it came in that exact same way. This is how it connects with the hope of the gospel here in verse 23. And looking forward, our hope of glory comes through the truth of the gospel. And that hope of glory is none other than Jesus Christ himself. Well, we certainly have great hope and great consolation. Some people believe this hope to be the same thing Paul wrote about to Titus. I take it that you're making a reference to Titus 2 and 13. And that's definitely a debatable point. And I'm going to explain to you why that is. In Titus 2 and 13, Paul calls the second coming of Christ our great hope. Okay, so a lot of people believe that this is making Colossians 1 and 23 speaking about the return of Christ. Now, I want to ask you, do you think Colossians 1 and 23 is speaking of the return of Christ? Well, it doesn't appear the main focus by no means. I believe it could be included in it. I'm not discounting that, but I don't believe that this verse is primarily speaking of the second coming of Christ. So once again, allow me to reiterate something right here. There is a possibility of someone being moved away from the hope of the gospel. If this was not a possibility, we would not have been warned of it. So this is going back to what we was talking about earlier. If you continue, all right, there's a possibility you'll quit continuing. So there is a possibility that you can be moved from the hope that you have in the gospel. This is a clear phrase letting us know you can backslide away from Christ. The hope of the gospel is Jesus Christ. If you're moved from the hope of the gospel, you're away from Christ. So there is a possibility we could be moved away from our hope. Yes. If we're moved away from Christ, that definitely affects our inheritance, Paul described to us. Amen. He's been talking about inheritance speech a lot through this chapter, yes, and he'll yes. bring it up again. But the fact of the matter is you won't get the inheritance if you're moved away. If you don't continue, we receive this inheritance by believing on Jesus Christ through faith. If we move away from that faith that was given to us by our hope in the gospel, we have moved away from Jesus as well. This means that we have lost all of these things that we've been studying. That's right. And if you've lost all of that, you have nothing to cling to. It is the hope of the gospel that we have heard, which harkens back to the faith comes by hearing doctrine that Paul laid down in Romans 10. Hey, why don't you read that portion for us so everyone in the audience can see how you're putting those two thoughts together. Man, this is powerful. All right, so let me read you now. Romans 10, verses 13 down through 18 quickly. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. 
But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. Man, I'm telling you something. It don't get any better than that. No, that's some of the best reading you can read yes, in the book of Romans even. Paul calls it the gospel which was preached to every creature under heaven. Hey, let me ask you something right here. Okay. Has the gospel been preached to every creature? If so, what's keeping the end from happening? The Bible teaches that once everyone hears the gospel, that Jesus will return. Yeah, that's true. But let me ask you back in return. Is this an expectation more so than a reality? Well, you know, it, to me, it looks more like expectation, but then that puts this only as a possibility. The problem with seeing this as a possibility rather than a definite thing is that Paul says the gospel was preached to every creature. Yeah, you got a point there. Well, this sounds like it surely is in the past tense, which makes me ask, when was the gospel preached to every creature? I personally believe that the gospel has not been preached to everybody yet, but it's such a certain thing that it will happen. It's spoken of as if it has already happened. Okay, I can see that. So Paul ends this verse by saying that he has been made a minister of this same gospel that we get our hope through. He says this as if it's a thing of high nobility. And guess what? It is. And it's even greater than that. But we need to go to verse 24 now and get going in this. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Well, Paul goes into this verse, speaking of his suffering that he has had to endure. What all sufferings do you think he's talking about? Right here, I believe he's talking about a specific form of suffering because it was the suffering that he did for the Colossian believers. He said that he rejoiced in those sufferings that he went through for their sakes. Okay, so he's suffering for their sake. Not that he was rejoicing for their sake, but he suffered for their sake. This is what Jesus taught us to do in Matthew 5 and 12, to rejoice in the midst of suffering. Well, then Paul went as far to say that he was willing to sacrifice for them or, or even be sacrificed for them, which is how some people interpret this. Yeah, and I can see both ways, really. In Ephesians 3 and 1, Paul said that the suffering he endured was for the benefit of the Gentile churches. To me, that makes it much clearer as to what kind of suffering he went through. Oh, yeah? Well, how so? Well, I believe he was speaking of his persecution from the Jews over going among the Gentiles. That's one element of Paul's life that a lot of us forget when we read through the scriptures. He had to endure a lot of persecution from the Jews and open criticism from the Jewish believers. He faced great hostility from the people he was one time associated with. Yeah, and guess what? I think it's very probable that even his actual family would have disowned him for what they would have considered having radical beliefs. Most likely, his own kindred counted him as a heretic, and they probably wrote him off. Yeah, and I think you hit that on the head, too, and I figure most of us do overlook that element. According to 2 Timothy 1 and 8, Paul told Timothy not to be ashamed of the testimony of Christ. He urged him to become a partaker of the afflictions associated with the gospel. Well, one thing, Paul never surely held back, and it wasn't just because of his nature or character. No, I believe he saw it as being fundamental yeah. of being a true believer. Here in Colossians 1 and 24, he said that he was busy filling up that which was behind concerning the afflictions of Christ in his flesh. He explains what this statement he made right here means in 2 Corinthians 1 and 6. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. In other words, we're suffering because of you and for you. Second Timothy 2 and 10, he says, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Did you notice how many times Paul spoke of being afflicted and enduring things? He was willing to be afflicted because it was resulting in the salvation, I guess, of other people. That's right. Paul was willing to lay his life on the line just to take the gospel message to others. He did this so they too could be saved. He fully believed that his sufferings were effectual or even more plainly having the desired effect. Well, you know, he said that he endured all things for the sake of those who believe. And this tells us that he did this just so these people could receive salvation in Christ. Amen. He mentions a little more of this thought also in Ephesians 1 and 23 which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. 
All right, this brings up something that causes me to ask you this. Whose body is this talking about? Is this Paul's own body he's referring to, or is this the body of the church? Or does it refer to the Lord's actual physical body? How should we understand this? Well, boy, that's a lot to process right here. This is a physical suffering. So is this a physical body that has been referenced? Going back to Ephesians 1 and 21 down through 23, Paul tells us in that setting, that the body he is speaking of is the body of Christ. Now, despite that information, this is not speaking of his physical body here in Colossians. I believe he's talking entirely of the church, the body of believers. Okay. And I do know the church is called the body of Christ within scriptures. That that does make sense. Yeah. So the sufferings of the body is actually the church. And this is how Paul was taking it on. He was suffering for the church, with the church, and by and through the church. The sufferings he felt in his body were similar to the sufferings Christ felt in his fleshly body. The church, as the body of Christ, will suffer persecution. The Bible states that in many different places, as they did unto Jesus, they still do the same things to his body today. And Paul, being part of the body, felt some of those same sufferings. All right, let's look at verse 25 before we get this thing wrapped up. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Now, the next phrase is a little hard to follow because Paul declares some of the reasons for why he had been made a minister. Uh, A little hard to follow. You know, that might be an understatement. (laughs) It might be. (laughs) Was he made a minister because of the church or the body of Christ? He was just talking about suffering. So is it because he needed to suffer these afflictions? Well, there again, you're asking some good questions. Well, how could it be that there was a sum total of afflictions that he had to suffer? I personally believe the answer goes back into verse 23 with the hope of the gospel that is to be preached to every creature. This in itself explains why he was made a minister. The gospel has to be preached. Somebody's got to tell somebody else the message. Somebody's got to bring that message. Somebody's got to preach that message. And that's something else that Paul has spoke about often. In Ephesians 3 and 7, Paul said that he was made a minister by the gift of the grace of God. In 2 Corinthians 3 and 6, Paul said that he was made a minister by the Spirit. And that's not a contradiction with his other reasons for being made a minister. Well, here in verse 25, it says it's according to the dispensation of God given to him for the people. Yeah. So what does he mean by that? Well, he talks about this in a couple of other places as well. And I know it does seem a little hard to follow. When you think each word through as you read it, it it does make a little more sense. Paul seems to have been very consistent in his ministerial accomplishments and routine, and he talked about these things frequently. In Ephesians 3 and 2, he said that the dispensation of the grace of God had been given to him, and he was talking about that toward the church there in Ephesus. In 1 Corinthians 9 and 17, Paul spoke of a dispensation of the gospel that had been given to him. What is meant by this term, dispensation? Is this proof that Paul was a dispensationalist, whatever that means? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there, a lot of people, they want to put themselves in a camp or they want to put you in a camp of, well, do you believe in covenant theology or dispensational? All right, look, Paul wasn't in either of those camps because he was one that was setting down the doctrine that people make those camps and those arguments from. Either way you feel about that. He was made or ordained a minister, and that's what he's talking about. This, in some way, helps him fulfill the Word of God. Well, how do you reckon that applies here, though? Well, for one thing, the word dispensation has a completely different meaning in this setting right here than it does today. We take it today to mean only a certain era of time. That's a dispensation. This right here is the Greek word oikonomia, describes stewardship or an administration of work. It's the act of being a steward over something or over someone. It doesn't mean an era of time. Paul knows that he'll be judged by all that he does and all that he doesn't do. So he was talking about God has placed a charge on my life. This is why he said in another place, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Paul was tasked with the job of managing God's people, and I guess more specifically the Gentiles. Yeah. So we know that God divinely arranged all of this, selecting Paul for this particular job. That's true. And we see Paul give a little more information concerning this thought in Romans 15. I'm going to read you verse 16 and 19, then we need to start wrapping this up. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. 
through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Alicrium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. He said, I've been made a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. I am ministering one thing, that's the gospel of God. And I'm doing this, that the offering up of the Gentiles, when all of the Gentiles are offered unto God, it might be acceptable being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. He said, I've done this through the spirit of God. I've done this in these areas, Jerusalem, all the way up to Elycrium. And I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. What a testimony. What a statement. Paul said he was made the minister of Jesus Christ unto the Gentiles, and he fully acknowledged the fact that he was sent to preach the gospel to them. He went on to say that he had fully preached the gospel unto them. He was fulfilling his calling that God had divinely placed upon him. This is how we should interpret the part of him filling or fulfilling that which is behind for the church's sake. This also shows his servanthood and his stewardship under God's divine authority. I agree, for that seems pretty plain to me. This has been another intriguing study today. All right, we've got a question in here today. It's a pretty interesting question. You ready for it? Okay, I like questions, and interesting Uh, questions are even better. All right, this should be a good one today. Our pastor stresses the need for us to witness and try to get people to come to church. Is this really necessary? If people truly wanted to come, wouldn't they just do it regardless? Well, I'm thankful for this question, and I'll have to admit I felt the undercurrents of this same sentiment within many churches for years. To begin with, I am thrilled to hear that your pastor believes in outreach. How many of us would not be saved today if someone else hadn't have reached out to us? I would be interested to know how the questioner got saved, the one who sent us the question. Uh Were you raised in church or did someone invite you to church? That really would factor in on how you look at outreach. I'd say most people who are not interested in outreach were raised in church. And people who got saved by somebody knocking on their door or inviting them to church are probably more so big on outreach. Our questioner asked if witnessing and inviting people to church is necessary. I believe it is. And I believe that it is because the Bible promotes this idea. That's why I believe it. Most people recognize Israel as the original chosen people of God. But did you know? The whole purpose God called Israel was so they would bring other nations to God. When God addressed the people of Israel at Sinai in Exodus 19 and 6, he told them that they were to be unto him a kingdom of priests. They were to be a holy nation. Let me read you that. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. What does that mean? Israel was to act as a priest for all of the other nations. So the other nations could approach God too. Think of it this way. The work of a priest is this. The priest brings God to man and he brings man to God. He's a form of a mediator. God and man are at enmity. There's somebody that needs to be a go-between. We know that Jesus is the great mediator. He's the great advocate. He's the go-between, but we are to act like Christ, are we not? And Christ is the high priest and we're to be priest under him. So we're to do the work of Christ. In other words, So if Jesus brings man to God and God to man, we're to continue doing that same thing today. You cannot be Christ-like and not do that. There is proof that all of this goes all the way back to Abraham's call in Genesis 12, verses 2 and 3. God said, I will make of you a great nation, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. How would they be blessed? By Israel being faithful to God and bringing other nations to God, those nations would be blessed by learning who God is through Israel. The sinful nation that we live around should know God and learn God through the Christians that are here. Salvation isn't just for your personal benefit. You got saved because God wanted you saved. But number one, because God wanted you saved so you would tell others about him to reach the world. We are all extensions of Israel's mission to reach the world, according to Revelation 1 and 5. Let me read you this. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Did you get that? Jesus is the faithful witness. There are some people who have been faithful to witness, but he is the faithful witness. He is the only one who has truly fulfilled what God wanted Israel to do and what God wants us to do. Our questioner asked, if people truly wanted to come, wouldn't they do it regardless? I understand that makes sense in a logical way, but it's only logical if you were raised in church. That's why I think our questioner was probably raised in church. All right, here's the thing. 
when you were raised in church, you think everybody else was probably raised just like you because that was the average home in your mind. There's a lot of people that were not raised in church that had nothing to do with church. They didn't even want to go. We were commanded by God to do something. And when we're commanded by him to do something, it doesn't matter if logic backs it up or not. Do you realize the reason God gave us the Holy Ghost? It wasn't so we would speak in tongues or shout altogether. It's that we would be a witness to others. The very reason God empowered the church with his spirit was so we could win souls to the kingdom of heaven. He didn't give us the Holy Ghost only for our benefit. He didn't save us only for our benefit. He gave us salvation so we could tell others that there is a Savior. He gave us the Holy Ghost so we'd have the boldness to witness of our God to others. Some people were not raised to go to church. You think an atheist family would raise their children to go to church? You think people who are drunkards and drug addicts would raise their children to go to church? These are people that have been raised up that have never seen a need to go to church. They may have never thought about going to church. Somebody's got to knock on that door. Somebody's got to ask them at work, hey, man, what are you doing this Sunday? Won't you come be in church with us? They may not have been raised to go to church, and they may never consider it. They need to be convinced. They need to be persuaded it's a good thing, that it would benefit them, that it would help them, and it would truly make a difference in their lives. If you never tell them that, how will they know? I encourage you to back your pastor in his teaching of outreach, and I want to also encourage you to try it for yourself. I think you might be pleased with the results. Wouldn't it be great to get to heaven and meet people who are there simply because you told them the gospel message, because you shared Jesus with them? Wouldn't that be worth it all? I think we ought to do more of it. Amen, Brother Donnie. Friends, remember, if you have a Bible question or a question regarding how news and current events or things going on in our culture are connected to scriptures, drop us an email at dkministries1977 at yahoo.com. That's dkministries1977 at yahoo.com. We hope you've enjoyed this episode today, sharing God's word. But until next time, may God bless you all. Be sure and come back next Friday, November the 1st, for episode number 334, The Battle with Lust. But for me, this I know, will it change my heart all around? Put my feet back on the ground, got along, and now for heaven I want to go. I want to go, I want to go to that land where the milk and honey flow. Oh, I've heard of such a place, I can't go there by God's grace. Never seen it, but I know I want to go.